boys and girls, it's me, Miss Steph. Oh, I miss you so much. I thought that today I would read one of our classroom favorites, Scrambled Egg Super. It's a Dr. Seuss book and it's so silly. Should we read together? I don't like to brag and I don't like to boast, said Peter T. Hooper, but speaking of toast and speaking of kitchens and ketchup and cake and kettles and stove and the stuff people bake, well, I don't like to brag, but I'm telling you, Liz, that speaking of cooks, I'm the best that there is. Why, only last Tuesday when Mother was out, I really cooked something worth talking about. You see, I was sitting there resting my legs when I happened to pick up a couple of eggs. And I sort of got thinking it's sort of a shame that scrambled eggs always taste always the same. And that's because ever since goodness knows when, they've always been made from the eggs of a hen. Just a commonplace hen? What a dumb thing to use with all of the other fine eggs you could choose. So I decided that just for a change, I'd scramble a new kind of egg on the range. Some fine fancy eggs that no other cook cooks, like the eggs of the ruffled neck Salamagooks. A Salamagook say they should be good, so I went out and found some as quick as I could. And while I was lugging them back to my house, I happened to notice a teasel top grouse in a tree down the street, and I knew from her looks that her egg and the egg of the Salamagooks ought to mix mighty well, ought to taste simply super when scrambled together by Peter T. Hooper. So I took the eggs home and I frizzled them up and I added some sugar, two thirds of a cup, and a small pinch of pepper and also a pound of horseradish sauce that was sitting around and some nuts and I tasted the stuff and it tasted quite fine, but not quite fine enough. To make the best scramble that's ever been made, a cook has to hook the best eggs ever laid. So I drove to the country quite rather far out and I studied the birds that were flitting about. I looked with great care at the mop noodle finch and I looked at the beagle beaked bald headed grinch and I also looked at a shade roosting quail who was roosting right under a lassalax tail and I looked at a sprints and a flannel wing jay but I did not stop. I kept right on my way because they didn't have eggs. They weren't laying that day. Then suddenly, boy, up the hill a short pace. Birds, they were laying all over the place. Great happy gay families with uncles and cousins, all laying fine, strictly fresh eggs by the dozens. Why, I'd have a scramble more super than super. Scrambled egg super dee booper dee duper, special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. I picked out the eggs in the most careful way, and I only picked eggs that I knew were grade A, and I only took eggs from the best fowls. So I did not take eggs from the Tweedler owls, because I knew that those eggs from those fellows who tweedle sort of taste like dust from inside a bass fiddle. Yuck. I went for the kind that were mellow and sweet, and the world's sweetest eggs are the eggs of the queet, which is due to those very sweet trout which they eat. And those trout, well, they're sweet because they only eat wogs, and wogs, after all, are the world's sweetest frogs. And the reason they're sweet is whenever they lunch, it's always the world's sweetest bees that they munch. And the reason no bees are sweeter than these is they only eat blossom off bees on our trees. And the bees on our blossoms are sweeter than sweet and that's why I nabbed several eggs from the queet. But I passed up the eggs of a bird called a strudel, which is sort of a stork with fur like a poodle. For they say that the eggs of this kind of stork are gooey like glue and they stick to your fork. And the yolks of the eggs, I am told, taste like fleece and the whites of the eggs taste like very old bicycle grease. Ugh. 
Oh, the places I hiked to, the roads that I rambled to find the best eggs that have ever been scrambled. I hunted new birds along wild tangled trails, through gullies and gulches and down dingles and dales. I wiggled my way and I crawled at a creep through a forest of ferns that was 40 miles deep. And I mushed through the brush till I found a fine quinger whose eggs were, no, were as big as the head of a pin. No bigger! Look how teeny that bird is. Then I went for the eggs of the long legger Quang. Now this Quang, well, she's built just a little bit wrong, for her legs are so terribly, terribly long that she has to lay eggs 20 feet in the air and they drop with a plop to the ground from up there. So unless you can catch them before the eggs crash, you haven't got eggs, you've got long legger hash. Eggs! I collected 302, but I still needed more, and I suddenly knew that the job was too big for one fellow to do, so I telegraphed north to some friends near Fazul, which is 10 miles or so just beyond the North Pole, and all of them jumped in their cataman side, which is sort of a boat made of sea leopard's hide, and they sailed out to sea looking for a grice, which is sort of a bird that lays eggs on the ice which they grab with a tool, which is known as a switch, because those eggs are too cold to be touched without which. Ooh, an icy little egg. And while they were sending, and while they were sending those eggs, I got word of a bird that is something that's almost unheard of. It's hard to believe, but the bird is a pelf, and she lays eggs that are three times as big as herself. How that pelf ever learned such a difficult trick, I never find out, but I found that egg quick, and I managed to get it down out of the nest and home to the kitchen along with the rest. But I didn't stop then, because I knew of some ducks by the name of the single file Zuzzamin Zucks, who stroll single file through the mountain of Zums, quite oddly enough, with their eggs on their thumbs. And some fellows in Zums, who I happen to know, just happen to capture a thousand or so, and they wrapped up their eggs and then mailed them by air, marked special delivery, handle with care. And I needed more helpers, so for assistance, I called up a fellow named Ollie, long distance, and Ollie, as soon as he hung up the phone, picked up a small basket and started alone to climb the steep crags and the jags of Mount Strugu to fetch me the egg of the Mount Strugu Cuckoo. Now these Mount Strugu Cuckoos, they're rather small gals. But the Mount Strugu Cuckoos have lots of big pals and they dive from the sky with wild clacking shrieks and they jabbed at his legs and they stabbed at his cheeks with their yammering, clamoring, hammering beaks. But Ollie, brave Ollie, he fought his way through and he sent me that egg as I knew he would do for my scrambled egg super de booper de duper special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. Oh. In the meanwhile, of course, I was keeping real busy collecting the eggs of the three eyelashed tizzy. They're quite hard to reach, so I rode on the top of my hickama, sickama, snackama, schnop. Oh, you know what these are a hickama, snickama, snickama, schmock. And then I found a great flock of southwest facing cranes, and I guess they've got something wrong with their brains. Because this kind of crane, when she's guarding her nest, will always stand facing precisely southwest. So to get those eggs wasn't hard in the least. I came from behind from precisely northeast. And I captured the egg of the Grickly Gractus, who lays them up high in a prickly cactus. And then I went for some ziffs. They're exactly like zuffs, but the ziffs live on cliffs and the zuffs live on bluffs. And seeing how bluffs are exactly like cliffs, it's mighty hard telling the zuffs from the ziffs, but I know that the egg that I got from the bluffs, if it wasn't a ziff from the cliffs, it was a zuffs. <clears throat> Now, 
I needed the egg of the moth-watching Sneth, who's a bird who's so big she scares people to death. And it's this awful big bird, well, the reason they name her the moth-watching Sneth is because that's how they tame her. She likes watching moths. It sort of quiets her mind. And while she's watching, you sneak up behind and you yank out her egg. So of course I got one with some help of some friends and a very fast horse. If you want to get eggs you can't buy at the store, you have to do things you never thought of before. Why, to get the egg of one very small Dwarf, you have to pry all of one mountain top off. See him in there? Yeah. Then I heard of some birds who lay eggs, if you please, that taste like the air in the holes in Swiss cheese. And they live in the Zinzabar Zanzibar tree. So I ordered a tree full. The job was immense. But I needed those eggs and said, hang the expense. Still, I needed one more and I saved it for last. The egg of the frightful, bombastic, aghast. <gasps> and this bird is so mean and this bird is so fast that I had to escape on Angelica Jast, which is a fleet, a fleet footed beast who can run like a deer, but look sort of different. You steer him by ear. And all with the searching and all through the looking, I had what I needed. And now for the cooking. And they rushed to the kitchen, the place where I stacked them. And I rolled up my sleeves. I unpacked them and cracked them. And I shucked them and chucked them in 99 pans. And I mixed in some beans. I used 55 cans. And I mixed in some ginger, nine prunes, and three figs. And parsley, quite sparsely just 22 sprigs and I added six cinnamon sticks and a clove and my scramble was ready to go on the stove. And you know how they tasted? They tasted just like, well they tasted exactly, exactly just like, like scrambled egg super. The duper deep booper special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. The end. Thank you boys and girls for reading with me today. That book is one of my absolute favorites. I know we read it at school together, so I was really thrilled to bring it to you on the internet. I miss you so much. Your teachers, we miss you and we love you and we can't wait to see you again. So from my house to yours, mwah!